Hi, this is Jenna. And this is Kelly. You're listening to ODFM. This episode is One Destination from Murder. Mine is called The Little Miss Case. It's, I know, it was submitted by my second cousin, I think she would be. She's like my dad's age somewhere, you know, everybody in Wyoming is related. So I gotcha. Her her name is the whole state. Yeah, the whole state. Pretty much. If you know somebody, someone else knows someone. Yeah, everybody's related. So her cousin on her mom's side was a detective on the case for this, or he did some investigation for this case. And this is all in Wyoming. And a little bit of it trickled into my life as a traveling college student, because it was during the time I was traveling back and forth from Montana and Wyoming. And I got most all the info from a book called The Murder of Lil Miss by Sheila Kimmel, who is the mother of the girl the story's about. Oh, gosh. You wrote a story about her own daughter? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's a little heartbreaking. So Lil Miss, L-I-L Miss, Lil, Lil Lil Lil. Miss, is the nickname for Lisa Marie Kimmel, not related to Lisa Marie Presley. It just happened. Or, Or Jimmy Kimmel? Oh, maybe he's a Wyomingite. Doubtful, but I'm hopeful. I'm hoping, but I'm (laughs) doubting. But she was given that nickname by her grandma um, as a child, and it stuck so much so that she got vanity license plates on her Honda CRX that had her nickname on it. So she was from Montana. She was from Billings. In 1988, she was 18, and she was working for Arby's in Billings, Montana, where her mom was a higher up in the company. She worked for like the corporate. Okay. And, and Lisa decided she wasn't quite ready for college. So she started that job and she really loved it. She was really good at managing others and helping struggling restaurants. So she was reassigned to an Arby's in Denver that needed help. So she was doing really well at 18. So she ended that is up really well because I, I, I worked at a McDonald's and I think all I got was a fry pin for like my one year anniversary. <laughs> I'm sorry. Really sorry. Fry pin. <laughs> I got a fry pin and like a 10 cent raise. Oh my gosh. Huge. Huge. Soon I'll be on fries. I know. Isn't that a McDowell's <laughs> restaurant from uh yeah. Oh my gosh, yes. yeah. Um coming to America. Coming to America. <laughs> right. Okay, see? Yes. I mean, so at 18 to be sent to another mm-hmm. store to help them out. I mean, that's that's an that's accomplishment. That's, that's beyond accomplishment. just getting yes. on the fries. Okay, sorry. What were we talking about? Was it a murder? Little I'm miss. sorry. Yeah. Little miss. Got it. She ended up loving it so much in Denver that she decided to move there permanently. And our family was still in Billings. So she often made the drive through Wyoming to go visit them. So yeah, yeah, to go from Denver, you even go through my hometown, you have to drive. And I'll put a map of it, of the route she was supposed to take that day. Because it comes in. Supposed to? Yeah. Foreshadowing. She had plans on March 24th, 1988 to drive to Cody, Wyoming to pick up her new boyfriend, Ed, on the way to Billings. And it was going to be her first time introducing him to her family. So it was like a big deal. That's a big deal. Yeah. And Ed was several years older than her, but he seemed to match her level of intellect because she was obviously very smart and he treated her well. So the day after Lisa left to drive to Cody, Sheila, who is her mom, received several calls telling her that Lisa never made it to Ed's house the evening before. Gary. So Ed was already on the road searching for her in case she had an accident or something, but he still, he was calling them and calling all the family, calling everyone. Because this is pre-cell phone for those of, pre, yeah, so for, for, for those of, so for those of you who did not live through that period and don't realize that there was a time. Yeah. Pre-cell so phone. You maybe had pagers back then. Maybe. Right. Right. Yeah. May, oh God. I don't even know. Was it I don't, pagers? I didn't have a pager, but because that was for like drug dealers and shit, but. Right, exactly, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, until, I right. wasn't that, that so, Yeah, I know. So it would have been, there were these things called pay phones. Yes. That, that would have been you had to go way. and find. Yes. And then you had to have exact change. Yep. And hope that you could get through okay. to someone. Yes. And hope that you could get through to somebody. Yeah. And that nobody had like spit on the earpiece or put gum on it or those things were so nasty or cut they they were always cut it seemed like yeah and the phone was cut yes he was searching for her and the family made plans to search along the route she would have taken all assuming she'd had like a wreck or something you know because right that car trouble something something. but ed even knew pilots he could hire to search from the air because he was i don't know he was from wyoming i mean you know from wyoming and Right. You know, everybody. So he knew some. Let me call the pilots. I'll call yes. in the pilots. So they wanted to file a missing persons report the next day, but it was 1988 and 72 hours was required before it filed. So 72, 72 hours? I thought it was like 
48, 48 hours. I know. That's 72. what I thought. 72 is a long time. So, um, but the highway patrol did agree to put out a bolo for her car. Well, that was know. nice of them. Yes. <laughs> that was nice. nice. And the family got a call back from the police saying that the night before at 9.06 p.m., Lisa had been cited for speeding near Douglas, Wyoming. And at that time, oh, and I remember this because it was still like this when I was a teen. At that time, you had to pay your ticket on the spot in cash. And How much yes. were these tickets that you they, could They just... were like 150 bucks. It wasn't like you could just, so of course Who she drove didn't... around with 150 it, it happened to me too. I, it, so this is what, what she What happens if you don't have it? She didn't have enough cash on her. Like this happened to right? me too. So the officer led her to an ATM in Douglas. Okay. And at that time, I mean, ATMs at that time were pretty new. And her I was going to say, I was surprised yeah. that was an option. Okay. Right. And her card wouldn't work because back then ATM cards would only work with compatible banks. So he gave her two options. She could either spend the night in jail until she came up with the money. <laughs> I know. <laughs> For speeding. Oh, yes. Door number one or door number two. Or she could sign the ticket with the promise to send in the money ASAP. So, of course, she took the only saying off, you know, like, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. The yeah. choices were spend the night in jail yeah. or do a pinky promise. Yeah. <laughs> um, really? Let me. See. Hold on. Let me let me weigh my options here for a moment. Are you this kidding me? <laughs> I know. Uh, because her, her ticket was given in Douglas, they searched mostly around that area between Douglas and Cody. And they finally got the police to file the missing persons report two days later. So it was 48 hours, not the 72. So at least they, they had a little heads up on it, but it's still three days after her disappearance. It was a Monday and the family had posters made and involved the media to aid them in the search. So they were like calling news and everything outside yeah. of the police, you know, trying to get anything. In because, the you know, yeah. my hands are tied until yeah. Yeah. 72 hours. They know something's wrong. Friends and family spent hours on the road searching and distributing flyers, but no one came up with anything. So six days after her disappearance, <sighs> Sheila, the mom, said she awoke during the night upon hearing Lisa yelling for her. <gasps> she said she sat up and saw Lisa at the foot of her bed, but she quickly disappeared and says that's when she knew she'd never see her alive again. Isn't that horrible? Oh, that's horrible. And I, I just know. got goosebumps. I know, me too. Oh. <laughs> I know. So Kelly, I really look forward to discussing true crime stories with you for our podcast each week. And you do such a great job of putting it together. Thanks. Well, I use Anchor, so it makes it so easy. I love the creation tools. They allow me to edit and record right from my phone or computer without all the expensive or confusing software. And it's free. Wow, all that and it's free? Yeah. Plus, they distribute our podcast for us. So we can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and so many more. That's awesome. And we can make money from our podcast with no minimum listenership, right? Yep. Anchor is everything we need to create our podcast in one place. I think anyone who wants to have a great experience making a podcast with a good friend should download the free Anchor app or go to Anchor FM, which is A-N-C-H-O-R dot F-M to get started. For sure. Now let's get back to that murder story. <sighs> so it had been six, six days. The parents were desperate for any help and they got in contact with a psychic because they were just like, we'll take yeah. anything, anything. Well, the police um, are doing a whole bunch, you know, so. Yeah, it doesn't you, sound like. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I could be wrong, but if, from what I remember from TV at that time, psychics were big. Oh, they were huge. Oh, <laughs> they, were yes, huge. they had all the call in the nine, uh, nine, oh my gosh, yes. numbers. Yeah. Nine, nine, yep. nine, whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So, and it's, you know, I'm thinking police aren't taking it so seriously. She's 18. She's, they're like, eh, she's grown up. She's right, grown exactly. Up. But we're they're desperate sure. and there's, yeah. you know, infomercials left and right. Oh, about, you know. And, and they were getting all these calls from different psychics. So they finally talked to one who asked for no payment because all these others are, you know, begging for money. And instead he, he asked them to bring something of Lisa's. So they brought her teddy bear and one of her shoes and the psychic took her items, held them close. Then he studied the map of Wyoming and he pointed to an area on the North Platte River near Casper. And with tears in her, his eyes, he said, I think you already know, but she's not alive. And they were kind of confused to the area he pointed out um, because it wasn't along the route she had planned to take. 
But the psychic even agreed to take them the next day to the spot where he thought she was, even though it was, wow. supposed to be, it was Easter Sunday. So oh, gosh. that evening was a Saturday. A sheriff's patrol came to the door um, and they had found a female matching Lisa's description, but they needed dental records for a clear match. So they sent it in and it was her. She'd been stabbed and dumped on the North Platte River <gasps> where the psychic pointed out 20 miles southwest of Casper, exactly where he pointed to. Holy cow. I know. She'd been dropped from the old government bridge, which is an abandoned service overpass that's only used by county workers and fishermen. Mm -hmm. But nobody else goes there. So they canceled the plans with the psychic, explaining that she was found where he said she would be. Her case would still take another 16 years to solve. Wow. So I know part of the problem was jurisdictional boundaries. So you always hear about, yeah, them fighting with the FBI yes. and not all agencies could or wanted to share information with each other. So right. it created all these internal conflicts. It was really frustrating for the family. Like there was chapters and chapters about their fights with the police on just trying to get something done. Oh, that's awful. So the family finally contacted Unsolved Mysteries for help. And it was probably only maybe a year after her death that they did. And they that's crazy up. because when you were talking about the psychic and that yeah. it was right where they found her right where the psychic said, I yeah. heard the, the unsolved mysteries, the, the, the background oh, music, the, yes. music, it played oh, in my head. So yes. I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm just saying, you, I was like, you were psychic mm. to the psychic. I was psychic uh, to the unsolved uh, mysteries part. You were. Oh my gosh. Okay. So they ended up filming an episode about the case, which brought in hundreds and hundreds of tips. And oh, the investor, okay. yeah, the investigators couldn't possibly run them all down. Cause I mean, it was like thousands and this is tiny Wyoming. <laughs> And right. Yeah. No, they did get the FBI involved in everything. But in 1989, this was a year after her death, another clue came in that they later found out could have helped crack the case. But because of the interagency <gasps> crap going oh. on, it didn't, oh, ugh, it wasn't investigated. A family friend had went to visit Lisa's grave in Billings, Montana, where she noticed a note taped to it. Creepy. Ron, Creepy. the dad hurried to the spot. She called him. He hurried over there, found the note, and it's sealed in a plastic bag dated November 13th, 1988. And so he immediately calls the police and he's like, oh my God, you know, there's this note tape to here. What do I do? Yeah. Um, the dispatcher says, sir, if it's a problem, just take it off. Oh, <laughs> you know, he's trying to explain. Oh my God. A murder clue. And, <laughs> but because this grave's in Montana. This isn't a problem with like littering. Okay. <laughs> yes. Oh my Hi, God. I'm calling to report that someone <laughs> left a piece of paper and I need someone to do something about it. Oh my God. <laughs> She's like, just take it off, sir. <laughs> And he's, he's like, no, 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 this is a murder case, you know, in <clears throat> right. Wyoming. And she's like, well, this is Montana. We can't do anything about that here, you know? So they're basically telling him to go oh, for himself. So he carefully tries to bag it up and, and sends it off to the detectives in Wyoming and kind of forgotten. But I got to read the note to you because it's really creepy what it says. It says, okay. Lisa, there aren't words to say how much you're missed. The pain never leaves. It's so hard without you. You'll always be alive in me. Your death is my painful loss, but heaven's sweet gain. Love always, Stringfellow Hawk. Really weird name. What? I know. What? So after some digging, they discovered that Stringfellow Hawk was a reclusive character from an 80s TV series called Airwolf, which I'm totally going to have to check out. Hawk, the character, was a chauvinistic guy all of his life in the series. People either die or abandon him. So he's just... Oh, oh he's torn, especially his love interests. And in each episode, oh, this is the best. In each episode, he would emerge as a hero. And at the end of each episode, he would play his cello as an eagle soared above in the sky. <laughs> but in the, in the show, his love interest ultimately dies. So that's like a clue in the note. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what our what our listeners could not see was Kelly literally <laughs> lifting up her arm and like making the sound and <laughs> God, it was awesome. <laughs> That's <laughs> uh, more of a crow than a, an eagle. I'm not sure of an eagle sound. <sighs> I don't know the so, difference. It yeah. worked for me. 
It works. Okay. I, I, I'm glad you felt the, the full force of that. I was there. I was in the moment. <laughs> you with experienced you. I was right it. there. <laughs> <laughs> ah. So um, the family felt like the police department wasn't doing enough or didn't have enough resources. So they decided to create their own task force. These people were on it. Yeah, know, and really? they were able to get the FBI involved. And luckily, the police had taken DNA samples from Lisa's body when she was found because they didn't know what was coming. And thank God they did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm actually pleasantly surprised. Yeah, that, that they actually did something. Her boyfriend and many others were compared and ruled out eventually. In 2000, so we've gone forward oh from 1989 gosh. all the way to 2000, they still don't have any answers. So the family contacts a company called Innerspace, and they use technology to search bodies of water for items. Innerspace searched a large reservoir near the North Platte River called Alcova Reservoir. It's right outside of Casper, which is where my grandparents live. So we'd go to this reservoir all the time. But oh boy. Um, they thought they would search the reservoir for her missing car because her car was still never found. Oh, her car was never found. Plates. Yeah. <gasps> but they only found an old tire and a picnic table. And they said it was the cleanest lake they've ever been to. <laughs> <laughs> Such little Good trash. for them. <laughs> I know. They're like, well, good. I guess it's the cleanest lake ever. So. And in 2001, though, Wyoming opened its new crime lab and their computers began connecting to the national data banks, which means the DNA sample also connected to the National Data Bank. But that didn't happen till when? 2001. Holy crap. I know. <laughs> Holy That's crazy, crap. huh? I know. <laughs> Finally, in summer of 2002, investigators visit the family to tell them they found a match to a man named Dale Wayne Eaton, who now was a 57-year-old federal inmate in Colorado. So Dale had owned land 75 miles northwest of Casper in an area called Moneta. And like literally... I was trying to find this place on the map. I'm like, Moneta, what? It's on the route to Cody that Lisa was taking. And it has like, I think on their population sign, it said 10. <laughs> Something like that. Ten. Not thousand. Yeah. Just, just 10. 10. 10 people. Yeah. So in the thousands of tips that had come over the years, he wasn't in a single one of them. Wow. I know. So that's kind of crazy. So when they first interviewed Dale, he denied knowing anything about Lisa other than what he'd heard on the news. But investigators found friends of Dale that were keeping some of his things in storage at their place for him while he was in prison because, you know, he's like, oh, I'll get out someday. But That's nice of yeah, among these things, police investigators found knives, a wooden club, flex cuffs and handcuffs, as well as a dildo and a plastic bag <laughs> containing rope. Can you hang on to this dildo that. for me? <laughs> You're right. Oh I might want this back after I get out of the clink. <laughs> oh, my God. <sighs> so they start a search on his land, which resembled a dump with junk strewn all over. There's a trailer, a barn, a garage, as well as a bus that Dale lived in. He didn't live in the trailer. He lived in a he bus. He lived in the bus. Okay. With no okay. running water, no electricity. Nasty. Oh, that sounds nice. Yeah. The searchers didn't find much of interest in the buildings, but they did notice sinkholes around his land, indicating areas that had been dug up. Oh. So they brought out excavators. And I remember during this point, well, before that point, because I had been driving up and down the, those same interstates. So my mom was so worried because lots of women had been disappearing around this time. Oh. Yeah. Jeez. So they bring out excavators, begin digging on his land, and it's a slow process because they are literally sifting through each bucket oh, of dirt trying to find things for evidence. And they finally come across a hubcap with a Honda logo on it. <gasps> and oh. she had a Honda CRX. They know they're in the right spot when they find a part of the Little Miss <gasps> vanity plate. Right. Oh. They continue to dig and they scrape against something metal, eventually unearthing the entire car. He buried the entire car. He buried the whole car? Yes. Isn't that insane? Dang. They brush away the layers of dirt to reveal the VIN number and it's Lisa's car. And they even come across some of the Lisa's items like a jar of Carmex and her Arby's work hat. So now that they find their guy, they do a little digging into him. And he had been stealing since he was 16, had been jailed for various things like burglary and assault. And get this, in 1997, he was driving to a welding job in Utah. So this would have been the years I'm traveling from college oh, and well, stuff. Well, you're taking those roads. Yeah. He comes across a couple and, and they're sitting next to a van parked along the interstate. 
they were newlyweds and their van had broken down. So he offers them a ride in his van. Vans again. Oh God, the vans. Yeah. vans. And the, I, granted, this isn't really hitchhiking. This is right. They were they stuck. Needed, they they needed were stuck. Help. They were stranded, but still. They, I know. They had their oh, dog yeah. and their four-month-old baby with them, too. Oh, God. Mm-hmm. But after a short while of them driving with him, Dale pulls over, saying, saying that he needs to pee. He asks <laughs> Shannon, this is the woman, he asks her to take over driving for him while since for a while, since he's tired, um, and she does. From all the peeing? <laughs> From all the peeing. <laughs> He's like, good Lord. I'm spent. <laughs> Can you drive for a while? I'm literally spent. <laughs> Jeez. So asks her to drive. As she's driving, the couple hears a click and he pulls a rifle on them and tells them oh to drive God. down a dirt road. Oh my God. So after driving for a while, Shannon is like, this is bullshit. She jerks the steering wheel this while driving. Bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> knocks Dale off balance and stops the van. And her husband, Scott, takes the baby, jumps out, and lays the baby in a bush while he goes to fight off Dale, who is Dang. still on Shannon. I know. They so are they're badasses. They're badasses. <laughs> so Scott and Shannon are both fighting him. And they get the gun away from Dale. But still, he comes after him with a butcher knife. He's freaking Did he baby. have in his back pocket? I guess. Where, where is this is <laughs> coming from. <laughs> it's his kit. Uh, but they finally fight him off, grab the baby, and speed away in the van to get help. Oh, and they took his van. They took his van. Oh. And then authorities go back and they find Dale what, where the couple said they left him and they charge him with aggravated assault. But he only spent two months in jail and then went to a halfway ha- house where he ends up running away from the halfway house. Well, yeah, because he probably only had to give a pinky promise that he would come back. I'll come back. What the hell is the system out there? I know. Look They're at- like, eh, it's the Wild West. <laughs> do what you want to do. Jeez. Okay, Bill Long, who actually my dad knows from the Game and Fish. Okay. He, he, he's a Game and Fish officer. He's out patrolling the Teton National Forest in 1988. He comes across a campsite. And he goes to talk to the guy who's in a van at the campsite. And the guy gives him the creeps that the creeps. He decides to keep an eye on him from afar. Okay. And he calls in the license plate and it comes back to this Dale guy who was then a convicted felon. So the cops come out, they find a rifle in the van. And since felons can't have firearms, he's landed in federal prison. So that's Finally. how he gets into the federal Because you more prison. than a pinky promise to yes. get out of that. Yeah. So good. So good job, Game and Fish, finally taking down Dale. <laughs> Thank you, Game and Fish, for standing up and taking care of this guy. <laughs> the feds, Jeez. the cops, they're all like, go ahead, bye, Dale. It's all good. So going forward, Dale's trial for Lisa's murder didn't begin until 2004. And this is when it's revealed to the family what Lisa had gone through. So she had oh, restraint God. marks on her wrists and ankles and had been raped repeatedly. And she'd been kept as his sex slave for six days before she'd been hit from behind, which caused a four-inch skull fracture. And then he stabbed her repeatedly in the chest, and she died from a massive internal bleeding. And they found out she did die on the night her mother had had the vision of her. (gasps) Get out! I just got goosebumps again. I know, it's creepy. But they think he had kind of, like, thought it was, like, they were in love somehow. Oh, he had, like, twisted it in his mind and all that. yeah. But they think that she had probably tried to get away, and that's why he ended up killing her. He was found guilty of first-degree premeditated murder, kidnapping, robbery, and sexual assault. He's the only person, even right now, on Wyoming's death row, and he's currently trying to fight it. Like, he's going through appeals right now, trying to fight it, because he's the only one. The Game and Fish just are like, nope, not (laughs) Game and Fish is like, we will shoot you. So they think that he actually is a possible serial killer because there are about a dozen unsolved murders of women in the areas he traveled as a trucker and most had gone missing hitchhiking and newspapers of those murders were found in his trailer but they can't link them to him yet have they finished sifting through all of his property and the sickles and the cool thing was so the family they beat him in a civil lawsuit and and were granted his land. They basically wanted everything. Get out. Her family owns his land now? Yes. And so they asked the fire department if they would want to use it as practice grounds and to burn all his shit down. So so they had everything burned to the ground. I know. They were like, (laughs) screw you. They didn't find anything else yet. But they think that he could be involved in that many more murders. And my next case is another one that 
could be related to him for next week. Ooh, okay, I can't wait. Thanks for listening to another episode of ODFM, hosted by Kelly DeVries and Jenna Swanson. Production and editing by Kelly DeVries. Theme music by Eric Swanson. ODFM is a satirical true crime podcast for entertainment purposes only. The stories you hear are serious and true. The comments and opinions are not. We apologize if any of our content is harmful or disrespectful. If you have a story you'd like to submit for a future episode, please email it to odfmpodcast at gmail.com. Visit us on Facebook and Instagram at odfmpodcast. And check out our website, odfmpodcast.com, for more information on our episodes, your hosts, or general shenanigans. Shenanigans.